Hello and welcome to the MBKM channel. Today we are going to Breen Down in North Somerset. On the end of Breen Down is a Palmerston Fort with World War II gun emplacements. So please join me for a visit to North Somerset. We're going to check out World War I, World War II and the 1860s. Welcome to Breen Down. We've now arrived and as you can see hopefully behind me there's the down which stretches out to the sea and the fort is at the end of it. So I'm going to um, walk up the hill which is quite a walk and I will see you all at the top. The walk up Breen Down is not for the faint-hearted and there are many places to rest and let other walkers pass on the way. The view from the path is quite something where you can see Breen and Barrow Sands in their full glory. Breen Sands is a holiday destination for many people and has a pleasure park for the kids and holiday camps with static caravans. The Bristol Channel Severn Estuary has the second highest tidal rise and fall in the world, which is 40 feet in two hours. If you do park on Breen Sands, make sure that you do this in a place that is safe. Many have not done this over the years and return to find their vehicle half underwater. The view from the top of the steps is tremendous and breathtaking. Attractions at Breen Sands include both caravan and camping sites. These include Warren Farm Holiday Centre, Pontins Breen Sands, Holiday Park, Holiday Resort Unity, Channel View Caravan Park and Breen Leisure Park. I'm halfway out uh, on Breen Down now. It's a very, very windy, um, but pleasantly cold day. I've walked this in the summer and in the winter. Walking in this weather, which is uh, spring, which is a, uh, a cold wind and a bit of warm sun is, is the perfect combination for this. Um, I'm gonna swing the camera around. Hopefully you may see Bristol Channel come up behind me. It's tend to be a bit overexposed at the moment, so I'll try and get it later for you. But I'm, I'm about three quarters of the way out to the fort now, and I'm very much looking forward uh, to seeing the fort. It was built in 1860. In that year, there was a threat from France to Britain. France increased its navy which Britain saw as a threat. So this, um, what is called a Palmerston Fort, was built and fully armed with um, muzzle-loading guns. The forts go across Steep Home and Flat Home Islands, which are in the Bristol Channel, and then they connect up with South Wales. So if any stray French ship sailed up here um, and caused a threat, there could be continuous fire all across the mouth of the Severn Estuary. Okay, I'm going to see you all when I get to the fort. I'm at the fort now in one of the gun emplacements. During World War I, the fort was used for gunnery to protect the Severn Estuary, uh, Bristol Channel, and it was also used for experimental weapons. World War II, the fort was completely revamped. Um, I'm stood in one of the concrete bunkers uh, in one of the gun emplacements. The gun emplacements, um, I'm going to get a couple of shots, maybe some footage. They were covered in uh, like a plastic dome, which protected them from the elements and protected the gunners. Like I said, the whole place was completely revamped. They had two six inch naval guns here mounted. Uh, I, I'm not sure if they ever did fire in anger. I don't think they did. But there would have been a lot of ammunition, a full battery, which is around about 160 men from the Royal Artillery here. Now the Royal Artillery from 1860, up until the present day, consisted of coastal artillery, garrison artillery, and royal field artillery. Garrison artillery obviously were in camps, 
field artillery out in the field countryside and coastal artillery here and many other places around the UK. The weather here today is, um, is changed since we've got out here. It's now a hailstorm in May. Uh, this is why I've chosen to come into this bunker and to film in here. Uh, I w I'm going to walk around the site. I'm going to have a look at uh, different aspects of the camp. I'm going to try. Uh, they had, as well as the six inch guns here, they also had searchlight units. Uh, World War II searchlights worked on what were called carbon arc, where they would have two rods which would be uh, electrified, and these would create an electric arc light which would light up the sky. Now, if you want to know about searchlight units of the Royal Artillery during World War II, watch the film with Benny Hill, Tommy Steele, called Light Up the Sky. This World War II gun position was for one of the six-inch naval guns and was very much the ABC of gunnery. It has plenty of ammunition lockers and a 180-degree arc of fire out into the Bristol Channel. The Royal Artillery used range safety boats during this period when live firing during training. And this practice ran until the early 1970s, until the British Army removed their World War II 5.5 guns from Hong Kong in 1971. There are two gun positions at Breendown. These would have been named A and B sub and would have been part of a larger battery for all the forts in the channel at that time. Both of the guns would have had overlapping arcs of fire. I'm going to leave the gun in, place, in placement now and we're going to head up to what is the main o, uh, OP, which is observation post. We'd, um, I was in an observation post unit in the Royal Artillery for many years and what happens is, is you observe your target, you signal back its position, the weather, um, what type of target it is, and what type of fire that you require for that target. And then you remotely fire your gun battery. So behind me, as you can see, is the, um, the main platform for what would have been the six inch naval gun in World War II. But the OP, I mean, you just don't fire guns. It, it just doesn't happen. So what happens is you have an OP, which is about two to three guys. Um, and you have an officer, a couple of gunners. And what will happen is the, the officer will game, gather the target data. Then the gunner will signal it back to the gun position. The gun position turns into tar uh, gun data and then it, the gun fires. Okay, so what we're going to do is we're going to walk up the hill a little bit and we're going to go to the main OP and then we'll all ha we'll have a look around there. Uh, the weather now has changed. The hailstorm has gone, uh, which was, uh, it was like sandpaper hitting my face. Um, a very cold day for May, but on the other side, walking around here and having to walk a mile out, the cold wind is very welcome. So come and join me very shortly for the main observation post of this gun battery at Bream Down in North Somerset. The outside of the main observation post shows that much thought had gone into this. And again, it's very much the ABC to gunnery with large panoramic views of the target area. Setting up an OP in the field is not as straightforward as the one here. You have to tactically take the position and you do not enjoy the facilities that would have been offered in this one. Looking inside the interior and you can see that time has taken its toll on this grand old structure and acro pops are being used to hold up the roof. The view from both levels of the OP give a good 180 degree arc of view and this would have been a great place if you were an OP ACK under training. I was an OP signaler for many years and an OP ACK under training when I left the Army Reserve. If you like trigonometry then this is the job for you if you are a budding gunner. 
In some respects, the art of gunnery never changes, and I would pit a gunner with a protractor against a drone any day. If the truck with the drone gets zapped, you still have to act your target in the good old fashioned way. During the Falklands War, sophisticated electronic equipment went down with the Atlantic conveyor and the gunners had to act their targets using the same process as was used in World War II and Korea. This is what, where the uh, OP team would have been, observation post of uh, about three to four gunners, which would have been an officer, an OPAC, and a signaller, a uh, kind of, couple of other bodies who would have done the similar jobs and somebody to put the kettle on, literally. There you go, you can see uh, the Bristol Channel behind me. Okay, so the, like I said before, these forts stretch across the Bristol Channel. There was one here, one on Flat Home, one on Steep Home, and more than likely one in South Wales. So you would get continuous fire Okay, I'm in the top OP now. Obviously, it's been defaced with graffiti. But these rooms would have had something like bunk beds in them, um, maybe cooking facilities, but that type of thing. This particular OP would have maybe had quite a large uh, group of gunners in it because of these rooms. So it would maintain a continuous presence 24 hours a day, seven days a week here. Uh, it's got um, metal shutters on the windows. That makes it blast proof. I'm just gonna go into the next room now. This is the, uh, I did the uh, bottom OP just now. This is the top OP. Now this one has got the, um, place for a stove and the uh, the chimney hole for the chimney which means this is where there would have been a coal wood burning stove which you could put the kettle on the frying pan on so like I said uh, the OP team would have had extra bodies to literally put the kettle on uh, make small amounts of food that type of thing because this particular fort, I mean, this is just my thoughts being an ex-gunner. You could be out here in 1942. You've been um, called up, out, not out your own choice, and you're posted here. So you get posted here without any choice. You go where they say. So you've got other people in North Africa fighting Rommel in the main event and then you're posted here and you're here in January, February and March freezing cold, soaking wet in a damp concrete bunker so this is why there is a um, place for a uh, stove heater and it literally it means you can have a hot cup of tea and something to eat out here but to my mind it's somewhere that i wouldn't have wanted to be posted if i was in the army in world war ii there's very little to do out here uh, when you're not working and it, i should imagine most commanders would have kept their men busy out here with a lot of uh, physical exercise so you could literally run around and bring down every morning before breakfast. Uh, so you get up at six, out for a run, and they, I should imagine they would do that. Now, I, was in, I visited this place on and off since the 1970s. And when I was out here in the 1990s, there was a man, I overheard, I overheard him talking in my ears print up. He used to, um, come out here with the Home Guard during the war, where they used to, um, the, they would work with the regular army, being instructed, and they used to do things like grenade throwing and that out here. So Home Guard used to come in here also to do training. Um, the Home Guard weren't like Dad's army. Uh, the Home Guard was another one. You had to do it. You had no choice in it. And you had to do that as well as go to work. So 
Um, and a lot of guys who were in the Home Guard were ex World War One. So they were extremely experienced in what they, in soldiering. Yeah, it's not like the uh, comedy show of Dad's Army at all. So this place, regular army, home guard at weekends, and uh, this is a, would be a typical OP for coastal artillery. This wouldn't have been called coastal artillery. That's a very 19th century thing. It's, it would have been all the Royal Artillery in World War II. Uh, World War Two. World War One, you still had the RFA, which is Royal Field Artillery, Garrison Artillery. But by World War Two, it's all come under one umbrella. Um, yeah. So, like I said, I mean, this is a full. It's been defaced here um, with graffiti. Really, I mean, I wouldn't mind if this was uh, protected, and you literally could pay pound or two to get in and it would be put back to its former glory which would be really cool. Um, and what, a place that is like that is Knopf Fort in Weymouth. Um, you've got to pay a couple of quid to go in but when you go in it's um, as much as they can do they've recreated through the ages from the sort of 1860s when you had that threat from France right through until World War II, and it's, it's, it's a good place to visit, yeah. But like I said, um, come and visit, it's great, yeah. It's not far from Bristol, it's not far off the M5 motorway, easy to get to, and uh, come and have fun. Yeah, okay, thank you. Thanks for watching. And for listening, this has been a Models, Books, Kits and Movies production for the MBKM channel. And until next time.